about uh, the tank, the Rhino drive that was tested yesterday, uh, what we learned from it going over the defenses, and then we'll move into the pneumatic drive and go from there. Who wants to take the Rhino drive? Okay. Okay. Uh, so very, very positive testing yesterday with the Rhino drive. Uh, the, the tracks held up very, very well. We didn't, we never threw a track. We didn't see any wear on the tracks. Uh, we, we did have some early concerns about how the, the actual drive pulleys were holding up. Uh, upon further investigation, we found that the, the pulleys that we were using were actually a pre-production sample. Uh, and we actually got them out of the mold machine while they were still hot. Uh, so I don't know if where the, the issue is coming from, but when we put in, when we did the same testing, uh, with uh, a production pulley, we saw none of the issues. So that was a very reassuring thing to see there. So we're, we're very confident in the, the Rhino Drive pulleys. We really like those. Uh, and generally the, the whole system was, was held up very, very well. It was very capable of driving over the outer works uh, defenses. Uh, and so the, the Q&A last night, we talked a lot about how, you know, which of the different uh, defenses that I could uh, breach, go over the top of. Uh, so feel free to check back to that video. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a very good test for the Rhino Drive. Very excited, very successful. Great. Do you want to give me a summary of how the pneumatic drive went? Pneumatic wheels? So uh, the drive setup we tested with six 8-inch pneumatic wheels uh, using the stock out-of-the-box kit chassis ratios um, and the, what, the uh, pneumatic wheel expansion kit. Um, in our testing, in comparison with the Rhino Drive, what we discovered is uh, it can absolutely cross all of the obstacles the Rhino Drive can cross. Um, it, it does take a little bit more effort. It will take a little bit more driver skill to be able to do it reliably. Um, we never got it stuck, uh, but we were always able to back out of whatever situation we got into. We didn't ever high center it or, or have any situations like that. So it's not an issue of ground clearance. Um, and uh, I think the one obstacle we really had trouble, if you want to refer to it that way, with is the is the moat. So uh, there are definitely some solutions for teams to, to deal with that situation. And uh, I mean, I I can see using that drivetrain as an existing competition. Excellent. Um, and so I know that Andrew from Rhino Drive had been watching the the thread and had asked a little bit about you know what is the pneumatic six-wheel drive robot look like when it's going through the defenses. And so we, I'm sure we have some of that video previously in the stream mm -hmm. that you can take a look at. Um, but were there anything specifically that you saw where it had challenges or maybe it took a little bit longer than the Rhino Drive specific defenses? It was, uh, uh, the moat was definitely the biggest problem. Um, the thing I will say that I, I observed, and you guys can chime in on this if you want to, is I feel like the pneumatic wheel drive is uh, it doesn't pitch as much going over the over the, the defenses. Uh, the Rhino Drive tends to come up at a fairly high angle and then kind of fall over the defense, whereas the, the wheel drive seems to be just a little bit more stable. You don't get quite as much lift out of it over the defenses, which I'll agree uh, with that. That's could be attention. could be kind of important. Because although although it looks cooler that you see that robot there, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's not your robot. But when it becomes your robot, <laughs> you, you probably don't want to see that during competition. One of the other things that we saw kind of going off that with the pneumatic wheel drive is it was a lot more bouncy as the, the Rhino drive would kind of come over the defenses and, and come down and, and drive off. So yeah, really high angle, you know, come over, you know, drive out of it. The, the pneumatic wheel drive would ride up and kind of bounce over the top of it. But it was more of a flat chassis as it was really going over the defenses and then it would kind of bounce on the, the way out. So the, the pneumatic tire is really acting as a good kind of suspension shock absorption yep. kind of a system. Another part, another part of the eight-inch pneumatic wheels that we like is our our ability to, in the future, vary the pressure inside of each of the tires. If we want it more bouncy, if we want it less bouncy, if we we want more grip, we can just we can just do those changes as we go. And, and I think at this point we're pretty confident. Sorry, Renee. Uh, we're pretty confident in in the fact that 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 the pneumatic wheel drive can navigate the obstacles. So I don't know that we'll spend much time playing with that because here again we're pretty limited on time. So we'll probably focus on being able to deal with other elements of the game. Uh, but that's definitely some testing that you should look into uh, back at your shops, is playing with the inflation pressure on those wheels if you're going to use them. So Mr. Uh, Rideman, J-A-C-C, asked what pressure are you using in the tires? Uh, we're about 15 PSI right now. Um, pressure gauge that I have available right now is not the best in the world. Somewhat uh, unscientific, it's, 15. It's, cl it's probably between 13 and 18. <laughs> All right, very good. 
Awesome. All right, so one of the next questions um, I wanted to talk talking over was about the prototypes that we had. So I know we have two prototypes in here. Can we bring them up onto the table? So, uh, Oh, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, can I do a quick yes. intro? Yeah. So one of the most important things, uh, that I, a piece of advice that we can give teams is a lot of times when you're building and testing prototypes, the, the first hurdle that you cross is not whether or not you're building this mechanism or that mechanism. The first thing that you're actually gonna end up testing, uh, the, the lowest common denominator, is the quality of the build. Uh, so we have, Mark Coors, who built some unbelievable prototypes. We're not calling them prototypes, we're calling them prototypes. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna bring those out, but the, these two prototypes built to very similar quality, very high quality, uh, and they allowed us to get very good kind of A-B comparison. So we'll, we'll bring those up on the table here. So the first one, uh, so the first one here, this is our six inch, High grip wheel drive. Uh, we have we could play with different uh, amounts of angle because we have uh, a variety of slats along the back curl here. Uh, so we could play with uh, different amounts of angle, you know, for the release of the shooter. We could also play with how the ball entered. So we were testing from you know behind and pushing up from the front, letting it roll in. Uh, one of the other things that we were testing is we could put uh, added material on the back here and then add you know various levels of compression. Uh, so. This prototype was actually driven off the, the side of the shaft just with a regular drill. Uh, so we put a half inch hex uh, drive in the drill uh, and, and we're just driving off that. So we did realize that a, st a kind of a stock cordless drill wasn't going fast enough. We had to move up to a, co a corded drill. Uh, and this prototype was working really well right around 3000 RPM. And just a, a word of warning, if you are using a corded drill for that, please be careful because you can hurt yourself pretty bad because those tend to run on pretty long. So just be aware of that if you're testing with a corded drill at your shop with a shooter like this. You know, some, you're using a lot of compression and it really bogs down the shooter wheel and might try to rip it out of your hand. So just be aware of that. Okay, uh, so once we figured out, you know, we, we kind of did some testing. We, we This was the first one that we built. We played with this one a whole bunch. We added different levels of compression. Um, and then we are like, okay, it, it works with a, a six inch wheel. But for, for the whole robot architecture, we wanted to see if we could use a four inch wheel, scale everything down, get a shorter height to the shooter. So with that, we'll, we'll bring out our second prototype. And this one's a little heavier. <laughs> a little heavier. So here you can see we're using the, the four inch blue 50A durometer stealth wheels. Uh, and we also have a single SIM motor on a spin box. And so this is how we're driving the whole unit. So here we're going a little bit closer to robot spec, uh, but we also needed more speed out of the motor. So our, our drill wasn't quite going fast enough. Uh, so now we have, you know, the, the nice feature of the spin box is it gives you an overdrive, you know, so that the axle is going faster than the SIM motor. Uh, and here we are getting really good shot performance. We actually just finished this uh, about 10 minutes ago, so we were playing with that just before we came on air here. Uh, we still have a little bit more testing. We got to find the, the edges of the operational window, um, but we're liking our our shooter, uh, I guess the, the hood here is what we're calling this, uh, but we may play around with this a little bit more to really define our shooter angle. Um, and we'll start to, I think, integrate some of the other systems under the robot and use this as a, a really solid test bed. Uh, Damien Hill asked, what has been your success with launching the ball? And so can you talk a little bit about what you've seen um, with these shooters, the, the success or challenges you found? Yeah, so with both of these um, prototypes that we made, we were, we were able to get the ideal shot that we talked about yesterday, the shot where we are on this quote-unquote safe zone of transit between the outer works, and we were able to get shots that ranged from there to a pretty ridiculously good range up in front of that and still be able to make those shots on the same speed. Um, the only variable that we have that might make some inconsistencies in our shots is the method that we're using is just pushing the ball up into the system. Um, our next step maybe for these prototypes is to add something to make that more consistent to see what our numbers look like. But for both shooters, they are very, very consistent in getting, getting the shots into the goal at the ranges we want them to. Do you, uh, from Tech Clash, we have a question. Do you think having two wheels on the bottom 
with a back plate is better than four wheels on the bottom and top. So we'll, we'll take this down for a quick second here. We'll bring that back if we need to talk about it. Um, so I think this is the, this question comes up anytime people build a wheeled shooter. Do you want to use a single axle shooter or a twin axle shooter? Um, I'm going to go on the stance and say uh, at, you, you will see robots win events, win regionals, win districts with both. Yep. Um, and you will, it's, it's going to be, you're, you're going to see both. I, I, to me, it's far more important to select one of these two options that integrates better with your total robot plan and then take that design, either one axle or two, iterate it a bunch of times, really build some good quality stuff, figure out if it's, you know, what you need to do to make that work and build that into the robot. Uh, one of these two is not a magic eight ball. You know, they're not going to work inherently better than the other one. You really gotta figure out what works with your robot system. So Alyssa Hartman asked earlier, do you have any questions for climbing? Or sorry, do you have any ideas for climbing? Ideas for climbing. <laughs> um, we, we discussed at great length whether or not a grappling hook should have three prongs or four, still undetermined. Um, outside of that, I think we, we haven't really set our focus on that too much. Um, we've been working on the, the prototypes and the drivetrain and, and some of the other things. I don't know if you guys have been thinking about it in the, the back of your head a little bit. I mean, last, last we heard, I don't know if they've changed their plans, but if you want to check out someone that's attempting to climb, go check out Robot 3 Days 1.0 as well. We may get to that. We may. Yeah, things we are may moving be. pretty nicely, <laughs> yeah. so uh, we may have time to get to a climbing mechanism, but we really haven't given it much thought yet. Or, oh my god, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that. There's that too. We don't need that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not Monday night. That's true. So we're about, what, halfway through? We're Robot only a day days? in. A day in. So we're a day in to Robot 3 Days. A little over a day. Fine. A little so over a day. Hours. Um, <laughs> how do we feel about Robot 3 Days this year? where we are, what we're doing, you know, et cetera. Like, what are some of your feelings about how this is going? Yeah. We are light years ahead of where we were last year. Yes. Last year, we had a lot more debate on whether to go with recycling containers or totes um, and figuring out what, what we were going to do. We were still debating it at this point. At this point, we've, we've already determined pretty much where we're going with, it's a shooter, Pretty much a six wheel drive base with the pneumatic wheels um the climber could get added later um we're really it goes through all the defenses yep Most um, of the defenses. <laughs> well we're working on the we manipulator we're working yep. on the manipulator yep. for the uh, um the drawbridge the sally um so we're we're really looking at a swiss army knife here do you so. want to talk a little bit about what that manipulator um, looks like, or maybe go grab the robot to show? Uh, is it in one piece right now? It, it, it's not in one piece, um, but if you if you go back into some of the archives for today, you can see us moving it around and manipulating all the items. It hasn't been powered yet, um, so so we're we're still um, going to talk about that because it will require uh, a significant amount of control, um, which I'm sure we can get into detail if we get that done there. But um, Anyway, what, what it basically is, is it's a double jointed arm that um, can manipulate most everything that needs to move. So, which is kind of what, what we're trying to do there and see if we can get something that comes together like that. Have you considered doubling up rubber wheels on a drivetrain to make a larger surface area to scale the rough train? I, I mean, I think that's something we might look at if we haven't had, had success with what we've Implemented. Um, if uh, right now the pneumatic wheels are doing a pretty solid job, so I, I don't know that we would add that unless we felt like we needed it. Yeah, I think it's a little prohibitive on uh, robot real estate. It would which, be which, um, Yeah, so uh, be be very careful to make sure you actually have space to put a ball through if you do that. All right. So we had uh, Damian Hill and Bobby Haddock ask similar questions about, you know, has your team attempted feeding the ball yet, and have you thought of a mechanism on how to pick the balls up from the ground? Yes, so that was, so both of those are actually in the works. We have a, we, we're calling it the dog bone right now, but it's kind of evolved into a little more complicated of a bone, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we do have a collection mechanism system and an interface between ground collection to the shooter. Um, nothing prototyped yet, but we're pretty well on into the design and 
there are other features that this dog bone collector can do and will do um, in the final robot. So stay tuned for those, possibly sometime tomorrow. Great. So, so we talked a little bit about software being something that was started on. All right, do you want to talk a little bit about what you've been doing with that and how yeah. it's So um, this year, since we are still, or we since we got a really good jump on design, uh, we've also gotten a good jump on sensors. Thank you. Dean. Um, we are actually going to have encoders on uh, the drivetrain, on the arm, um, so our Swiss Army knife that Ben's working on um, to kind of choreograph a lot of the actions that we're going to do. Um, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to have a beast of a robot. We're going to try to make you do some fancy stuff here, so yeah. you know, stay tuned. Awesome, so we're going to jump back to drivetrain. Mr. Ridman JACT asked the question uh, on the Rhino Drive: Have you tried changing the angle on the front or changing the center of gravity yet? We haven't really played around with the center of gravity. Uh, the way that that chassis was uh, put together, the battery was pretty close to uh, the, the forward low wheel. It was kind of right at that front cross member. Uh, so it has a, and maybe you say a little bit of a forward or, or a neutral CG. Uh, and so I think that kind of helped as it was scaling up it, it kind of gave it time to rise and, and crest over things. Uh, but the, the front angle is mostly set based on the tension of the belt. Uh, there is a second uh, kind of almost an Easter egg position where you can put the, uh, the, the belts so that the, the front vertical member is actually very close to flat. Uh, and that would give you uh, almost effectively like an eight wheel drive, kind of very long uh, kind of belt. It's about a 30, 32 inch long uh, setup. Uh, and so if you wanted to kind of go over things like that, there's, there's a second set of mounting holes. Uh, so that, that kind of works out of the box. You still have the turnbuckle to you know, do a final adjust for tension. Uh, but so those are kind of the, the two configurations that it runs out of the box. If you added you know, a secondary idler you know, or a secondary tensioning system, then you could you know, run at different angles, kind of independent of what you need to do to, to set up tension. But we haven't really we haven't played with that at all. We, we kind of set the tension to where we like it, and, and that sets the leading edge of the, uh, the leading angle of the robot. Something that I, I don't think we really talked about, but I wanted to clarify is, I think at this point, uh, we, we're probably gonna stick with the six wheel pneumatic drive uh, through our prototype. That's what you will see on our finished robot. Uh, not because the Rhino Drive does not work, that's absolutely not true, it's, it's functional, it works very well. Um, but the nice thing about the pneumatic wheels is it's kind of a cheap option, uh, so it's easy to get a hold of. And, and we, the, the one for you frame is giving us a lot of very good places to mount not only our, our systems, but our shooter, our, our double jointed arm, our intake, our electronics, you know, the, our, our bumpers, thank you. Um, so it's the using that framework is just a, re a really nice foundation starting point for the whole robot system. Awesome. So let's jump to um, what early season uh, tips and reminders do you have for teams based on what you have seen so far? So for tips and reminders for teams, uh, especially at this stage, uh, don't try to move too fast. I know you see us moving at a pretty quick pace. Um, some teams, depending on how your team runs, um, some teams use this whole first weekend just to figure out their strategy, make sure they have it down. Some teams use it for some initial prototyping. I would say just make sure you're moving at a comfortable pace for your team and don't try to accelerate it because you see other people and other Robot in Three Days efforts trying to move at a faster pace. All right, um, two, two things. Um, on, on your team, don't, don't assume that everyone looks at everything the same way. Um, because sometimes some people on teams need to feel it in their hands and see it for themselves to really understand it and sometimes other people like to think it through so make sure you're understanding both ways and understand both types of people as you work through it um, in, in that sense I'm one of the other types of people so I like prototyping everything some people like designing it through first so uh, keep that in mind and remember that on your teams because you'll find that you run into a lot less conflict if you uh, if you keep that in mind you're up. 
Oh, I have to give advice? <laughs> yes, Sage. Uh, well, I'd say um, in, your, in your planning process, uh, so I'm a controls engineer, so I have to say this, is that um, when, you're, when you're planning out your mechanisms, think about how you're going to control them, right? So uh, we've, we've set up our, the, our, the uh, ARM system so that it has encoders built into the motors, and so that's in some sense planned out already. But you know, don't just put together, oh, I'm going to use this lift or whatever mechanism, and then like, don't put in your sensor or whatever as an afterthought because it is going to bite you if you do that. So make sure you say, OK, I'm designing it like this, and make sure it has enough power to do what you want, and give it a little headroom so that, because if you don't know, feedback control requires that. And then also, make sure that you have feedback. So make sure you get your sensors designed in. I guess I would say, um, in my mind, the most important thing to remember is every idea, within a reason, that you come <laughs> up with in, in the brainstorming process, you will see a competition at some level. Uh, it is far more dependent on implementation than it is the actual base idea. So um, sometimes if it comes down to big, long discussions about which way you should go, it really doesn't, doesn't do you a lot of favors. Sometimes it's best to, to, to pick a method and just go for it because if you have a little bit of extra time and you can spend that time making sure your implementation is good, it's going to be a better robot. Um, I'd say uh, from, a, from a design point of view, uh, try to, uh, from the onset, think of the robot as a whole system. You know, really think through how like your intake is going to feed to your shooter, is going to be affected by uh, your your outer works defensive you know buster mechanisms. Um, try to try to think through things as a system and, and make sure that you always know how one thing affects the other. Uh, but then as you kind of move through the design process, see if you can identify some of your your lower priority things as something that you may be able to you know push off or or delay until the main base functionality of the robot's complete. So if you can kind of build in stages, build your chassis, make sure that's you know, running. Get that to your software team so they can start playing with it. Then you know, maybe build your shooter, you know, work on that, and, you know, get the, the bulk of the team behind that. You know, and then move on to these other things. That way, at, when, you know, when you get to stop build day, you'll have you know, your base functionality taken care of, and you can always bring more upgrades you know, when you get to tournaments and when you get you know, later on down in the season. Um, so about the, you guys have covered pretty much a lot of it. Um, about the only thing that I can add to that is kind of piggybacking off of what Danny just said, and that's focusing on your strategy now. Figure out what your strategy is gonna be, prioritize what you wanna do, and then focus on that first. Don't try and be a, ma a, a jack of all trades. Be a master of the first, your highest priority first, then move to the next. Master that one. Move to the next. Don't try and be a jack of all trades. Our uh, our climbing case is a perfect example of that. At least yes. for us, right? mm -hmm. we said, you know, let's focus on these other elements of the game first, and we'll get to climbing if we have time and weight and resources. Mm -hmm. In terms of other things to keep in mind, I think it's important to always check the manual updates yep. uh, and yes. the Q and A because mm -hmm. I'm sure that after this first week, with questions coming in, we'll probably have a few updates. Um, and also to, you know, remember that this is a very intensive six week time frame. And so getting scouting and strategy teams ready now so that, I mean, I, I see not only a scouting team watching these matches, I see a strategy team that works between scouting and drive teams. Yes. Like that is by the robot, like, in, like wherever they need to be trying to support the team. So I think that those are some interesting things to start considering now instead of waiting until so I want to move into um, thinking longer term and kind of tying into that last bit about how the game is going to change. Uh, Jacob Davis had a question about uh, what is your opinion of the changing of the starting strength of the castle throughout the season? Do you think first is preparing teams to be able to score eight boulders easily? I think it's the same with every major game piece every year. They always put some sort of stipulation that it could change the championships, but most of the time they've done they've vetted it through the process and they're pretty happy and they've, they've figured out the balance of it already. <coughs> yeah, part of this is uh, to prevent what happened with Minibots in 2011, where it was just, it ended up being a mad race for that and 
it ended up being who won the mini bot race as opposed to even caring about teams. So ever since then, they've always had a little bit of something in there to um, just in case. So from uh, Drew Nagayo, uh, based what? Maggio. Uh, based on your experience with the pneumatic drive, uh, would pneumatic wheels work with an AM133 square configuration? Um, so the we actually right now uh, we have a 30 by 30 frame right now. Uh, and we did a little bit to bring the frame in with leaving the wheels in their current position. So our frame is square uh, by all definition. Uh, but we, we did that through frame, not through you know making any alterations to the wheels or, or to where they're placed. There is another set of axle holes inward that you could bring the wheels. Uh, I'd be very curious to kind of see somebody tr test this out. We were a little scared of it uh, because bringing the wheels that close together with a pneumatic wheel drive is going to make the robot, you know, your, your actual contact patch, your wheelbase from the center of your outer wheels is very, very short, which means the robot's going to be able to, if it's tall, it could roll onto its face very easily. So you, you can bring the wheels in, you know, another two inches from where we have it now. Um, but you can do a lot of things just with your, your frame in general and not needing to, to mess with the wheelbase. All right, so we have a question in um, from 1747, Harrison Boiler uh, Robotics. Woo! Yay! We know those guys. Yep. Uh, do you have any advice for teams who are trying tread for the first time, like in terms of durability, maintenance, etc. I have a piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> Implement active tensioners, please. I'll help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other advice from the group? Um, I think the constant, you know, not maintenance, but it definitely should go on your in-between match checklist making sure that your, your belt tension is right, making sure that you know the, the system is working well. Um, you wanna kinda inspect the tread, make sure you're not damaging any of the internal uh, teeth or, or blocks or, the, or shark fins. Uh, just kinda keeping an eye on it, making sure it's something that you're, you're watching. This is a new product line for Andy Mark. Uh, it's not like the, the kit chassis, which we have you know several years of experience on. So Andy Mark knows that the, the kit chassis is gonna work kinda throughout the entire season. Well, the, the tank tracks is, is a little bit of a new thing for us. So uh, just watch out for stuff, um, keep an eye on it. Uh, I'm sure all these teams out there can, can fix or, or handle any of the issues that you know could pop up throughout a, a competition season. You guys are, are good at handling those things on the fly. So just make sure you're watching it. I think, and one more thing, uh, as with any drive system, make sure to test it under the appropriate way you would think the robot would yes, ride. Um, especially not just the weight on top, but make sure you balance it the way you think your robot's gonna be balanced. Cause Especially with the way attack drives, track, track drive sets up, uh, it could it could really either help a lot or detriment the way the the, the drive train works and functions itself. Yeah, I'll go one further with that. Make sure you test on FRC tight pile carpet, and not concrete floors. Yeah. There's a lot of teams that do that, and um, the closer you can make your competition, your setting at home in a competition setting, the uh, the more successful you'll find that the tests that you do at home match what you do on the field. And turning scrub is going to be a yeah. huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's it, it's a big deal you encounter with with just using the the traction wheels, like with blue nitrile like we've used in the past. Um, but consider you have a whole strip on the ground. You're not applying force down over the whole length of it, but it's still going to be there for scrub. So making sure that you gear appropriately is going to be important too. Awesome. So um, we have this up here, um, you know, because it clarifies some of the actual Yes. And so did you want to talk a little bit about that? This information is on the AM1 for you 3 page, yes, um, but I thought it would be helpful to kind of just show this um, since you're giving tips. And mm -hmm. So if you guys can see here, and if you, this picture will be up on the, the 1 through 3 page. So there, like we kind of talked about yesterday, there is a set of holes for a long configuration chassis and a set of holes for a wide configuration chassis. Right now, our uh, eight inch pneumatic wheel drive is running in this green hole here. This is the kind of designated as the, the eight inch hole, uh, the eight, eight inch wheel long chassis configuration hole. Uh, so it's the outermost green hole. But if your team wanted to go with a little bit shorter chassis, right, you could always move back to the first red hole. Uh, and that is the wide configuration four inch wheel. 
Uh, that, that's kind of where that hole originally came from. Now there are stock belts for all six options, uh, so that's not uh, a worry. Uh, but so you can you can use a lot of different things um, and play with a lot of different stuff. The wheels don't contact each other; they don't interfere. Uh, but you can bring the robot in another two inches by going to that alternate set of holes. Awesome. So our next question is from Dylan Griffin, which is: Have you guys thought of bumper placement since it can be placed anywhere from four to twelve inches off the ground? Yeah. So right now we have it set up um, not on our robot physically, but we have it set up so that the top of the bumper is at the 12 inches. That, we're just doing that to give ourselves as much clearance as possible. Um, that could change if we figure out that we'd like it a little bit lower, but for now that's kind of where we're setting it. And we are just doing the eight inch on each corner. The big consideration there is making sure that you have enough clearance between the bottom of the bumper and the ground that you can deal with all the obstacles and the robot doesn't either get caught in a position where it's stuck because you hit the bumper before the wheel or as you're traversing an obstacle, the bumper ends up sitting on the obstacle and putting you high center. So those are the considerations there. So a question from 1747, Harrison Boiler Robotics. Um, which defenses have seemed to be the most difficult based on our testing? Drawbridge. Drawbridge. Yeah. Drawbridge. 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 Drawbridge if you're trying to go for at it from, um, from like trying to attack the defense. Right. If you're going back in the opposite direction, it's pretty easy. Yeah. But um, probably the... The one from either direction that's the hardest is probably the port police, I would say. I'd agree. True. Yes. It's kind of a choose your own adventure it's, there. That's yeah. like yeah. a, that's really, uh, someone will design a mechanism to do it. I'm not exactly clear on how that's going to happen, but that's kind of the hardest obstacle to be able to do with two robots too. Um, the drawbridge or the sally port, you can use two robots to get through. Uh, whereas it would be really difficult to support that gate for another robot to go through it because you only have 15 inches of excursion from your bumper perimeter. Yeah. Frame perimeter. Sure. Frame perimeter. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to try our best to try to do the drawbridge so low, so we'll, we'll see where we go with that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what our next plans are for finishing prototypes, working on pickup systems, where the manipulator's headed. Like, Let's give them a quick summary about where we're looking to go from here. Sure. So, uh, like we said, we, we finished our second shooter, our four-inch wheel shooter prototype, just before we went live with this video. Uh, so after the video, we're going to get it back out into the, the test field uh, and really kind of find the, the optimal range, find how close it can go, find how far it can go, uh, really kind of try to size you know, that envelope that we have. Uh, so we're, we're going to do more testing and evaluation with the shooter. Uh, I'm sure then we'll, we'll start to switch into an a intake system you know, prototyping. Uh, we've got some cool parts, uh, you know, stock off the shelf uh, that we can upgrade from that. Uh, but we, we've kind of decided that we want to go a little bit further uh, with those things. So we, we've got some add-on plans for those things later. Uh, so I'm sure that's going to kind of be the next major phase of our prototyping. Uh, and we're still working out um, with the, the active uh, two-jointed arm, um, getting that hooked up, getting the software and the, the control scheme, you know, set and ready to go so that we can start driving that uh, via the, the motors and the controls, uh, not just kind of doing the, the marionette, you know, moving around by hand. So those are, I guess, kind of the, the three big areas, and, and those are our goals, I'd say, maybe for the end of the night, but those are definitely our, our next steps. Awesome. So then uh, we just had a question come in, uh, which was, how would you plan on adding a scaling mechanism to the current we haven't talked about it as a group, but I think we all have our own ideas of how we'd accomplish it. Um, to the middle, off to the left. Yeah, off to one of the sides because we haven't really occupied space on the sides yet. We kind of occupied through the middle of the robot. So there are there is a channel on e either side of the outside that is unoccupied that, although we don't have an omnidirectional drive train, would be an easy place to put it, even though we'd have to turn and do it sideways. Oh, I can go forward. We'll just do it. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Deal. Okay. Deal. All right. Yeah, yeah, just like that. The other idea is you drive, you drive up the wall, apply suction cups, and pull yourself up that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just like that. <laughs> gecko feet. Gecko feet. I, I like that one a lot. We saw a JPL robot that had some gecko feet that could punch. Oh no, the, the new Disney, uh, yeah, the, the Disney, Disney robot yeah. that, uh, yeah. that has the propulsion against the wall. There that we go. Would do that. <laughs> All right, uh, so the next question from 1747, it sounds like they're tuning in from a team meeting. Thanks, guys. 
Um, More teams should be on meetings. Like yeah, well, you know, I'll have to meet on some days. Um, how do you, you guys think the alliance will break down this year? <laughs> um, different every match. Uh, it'll no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> like, there won't be enough robots that are. There won't be two similar robots. In a lot of years, 2014 was a great example. 2014, there was a lot of robots that, through different mechanism or different things, had a, a very similar level of, of capability. They could intake a ball. They could throw a ball. Uh, they, they could drive around the field effectively. They, they could all kind of do the facets of the you know those, those major facets of the game. This year, I think you're going to see some robots that shoot from. You're, they're going to shoot from different spots, or they're going to climb so many different defenses. They're going to move about the field in different ways. They're going to be good at different things. So I think every single alliance is going to be in qualities. Is obviously going to be very, very different. But I think even when you get to Elims, each match an alliance is going to play the game in a different way. I think you're going to see different roles and responsibilities mixed up uh, for probably quarterfinals. Maybe you start to see it, you know, gel in semifinals when teams go, okay, we know how we're going to score points and this is how it's going to be. But I think variability is going to be the hallmark of this year's game. That's what I mean. And not only, not only with just the robots changing the way they interact, it's also the fact of the dynamic field. That we're playing the th same three games or two games in your quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals, but you are playing on technically a different combination of the field. So that brings a whole new light on who does what faster. Your robot's designed to do that one thing, but if it's not there, then the other will have to take over, so it'll change match to match. Yep. Do we miss right. the question? No, no, okay. I actually have a side tangent um, that I want to take it on, so Brett, that's a warning for you. Um, uh -oh. I wanted to, you know, with, with the changing game and the fact that, you know, it's going to be different every match, what advice do you have for rookies? Because Ooh, I make just, sure you can logo. Okay. <laughs> yes. That, 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 above anything else, like seriously. Um, <laughs> it, I, I'd yeah. say the yeah the one thing that we know is going to be on the field twice every single match is the low bar. If your robot can get a ball, take it into the other zone via the low bar, you know you're going to be able to do that. And you doing that, drive through the low bar twice, ten points. Score a ball in the low goal, points. If you cross into cross into the uh, zone uh, during autonomous, which could be you know just driving right, landing up straight, just drive straight, more points. So just yeah, driving your your robot around. They have six weeks. Driving the robot around, making sure you can effectively go through the under the low bar, you can be a very valuable member to your alliance. Yeah, a short robot that can low goal and pick up a ball off the ground. That robot has so many uses in so many elimination alliances in this game. So to rookies, the two things to take away there are drive train, drive train, drive train, and keep it thing. simple. Sally. So. Sally. Sally. Whatever. Sally Sally. Keep it simple, Sally Port. Yes, Sally Port. Keep it simple, Sally Port. Yes. 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 All right, so moving into the next question. Um, for, this is from uh, Dylan Griffin. What uh, do you think a robot's drivetrain um, plays a bigger role in competition success than any individual mechanism? I got this. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Tr try scoring points in this game without moving. <laughs> can't be done. It can't be done. So you got to move. You got to, got to move. Above all else. Effective. Um, just move in general. Do it. <laughs> All right, so then coming in from um, Bobby Hot uh, from Team 5601, the Circuit Birds, Ooh. how successful were the pneumatic wheels in going over the moat and going over the rock wall? So we talked a little bit about the moat, let's talk again. Rock wall was not bad. Uh, it's, it's a little rough. That's probably the highest pitch configuration that you get into with that drivetrain. So you see the highest angle out of the drivetrain on the ascent and on the descent. Uh, but it can do it. Uh, what we found is the, I guess, operational configuration that works the best is if you approach it with uh, not a lot of speed, but some speed, and you maintain that power all the way through crossing the obstacle. Stopping with a set of wheels on top in that corner of the rock wall between the two sets of wheels is where you will get stuck. And, and when I say you get stuck, you don't actually like 
you, you can get down, you just can't continue to move forward across the obstacle. Right, you, so, have, you have to back up, start over, try it again, so. And even with the goofy control system setup that we had for the system yesterday, Danny was able to do it without, without really all that much only he did programmer's time. Oh. We're forty. We're twenty-eight hours in. It's already. Been I mean, that would Why be not? working nice to give oh. your programmers time. <laughs> World small silent. All right. So from uh, Jacob. Davis, from Jacob Davis. Uh, when is the go configuration determined for a match? Oh, okay. Our, rules, yeah. our rules guru. All right. <laughs> what? So, the how the queuing works is. You are queued, so there's the match going on, there's Q1 who's on deck, Q2's in the hole. Q2 has to determine their configuration before they move to Q1. They have to turn that in. At that point, they'll combine the two, they'll give the people who are on deck a map of the field, except for the audience uh, selection. When they get onto the field, that's when they will determine the audience selection via popular vote, which Danny and I will be loving that process at Tip Canoe in week two. Ooh. So, uh, and as a quick note, the the audience selection, you know that it goes in position three, and you'll know which category will be there. So you'll know that it'll be category C. You just won't know if it's C1 or C2. That's the thing that is you know, left to the last minute. And that'll be determined on your qualification schedule. So yep. first thing, Friday morning, or for your first day, whenever that may be. Um, so that first day of, of qualification matches, that whole list will be randomized for you know what is in what position. Other than, obviously, position five is always the local. And three is always the And audience. three is the audience, yep. Awesome. So uh, I wanted to bring up that our next Q&A is actually going to be um, tomorrow. So it's Monday, uh, January 11th um, at 7 o'clock p.m. So we'll go from 7 until 8. Um, that should be during team meeting time. Oh. So hopefully we'll get some Q&A in there. Um, we have it posted on Chief Delphi. Uh, make sure to watch for the link via our Twitter and Facebook at RI3D Indiana. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to do before we signed off, because we didn't do a highlight video this year, is I wanted to do a quick, um, very short intros for each of the people on the team oh. as with your, oh, your name, your <laughs> alumni team, and then let's do um, current team you know, as well. I'll just do those three things to try and keep it simple. Or you could say your volunteer role is that that works better because not all people are with teams. So, um, it's so my name's, I'm, I'm giving you an out here, like, why are you keep going? All right, uh, so I'm Renee Becker-Blau, um, and I was a student on Team 1675 from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I am now uh, working with 17, no, sorry, 1529, um, every once in a while. So. Right. My name is... Hey, what's your job? What do you do? That's cool, too. I skipped over that on purpose so that everyone would talk about their job. Fine. Fine. My name is Charles Nepomuceno. I am, um, this will be, I guess, 11 year veteran for the Tech Hounds, five years as a student, six years as a mentor. So I've been there for the whole time, basically. Cool. All right, uh, I'm Ben Martin. I was originally on Team 234 back in high school, uh, Cyber Blue. Um, I mentored Team 1747 for four years through college. Um, so that's my Indiana connection here. Um, now I work out in Pennsylvania with Team 225 Tech Fire, who um, I'm the, one of the lead mentors and the drive coach. Uh, I'm Nikhil Bajaj. Um, I guess I have been working with 461 Westside Boiler Invasion for a really long time. I guess I was there in high school and I am still working with them now after many years. And uh, yeah. <coughs> My name is Charlie Baxter, and uh, I was a student on Team 1741, uh, one of the founding members of that team in high school. Uh, I was there for three years and uh, went up to Purdue for school. Uh, started mentoring Team 1747, mentored them for three years, helped start a rookie team, and then I've been back since. This would be my 11th season. My name is Danny Blau. Uh, I was on Team 1259 uh, Paradigm Shift from Pewaukee, Wisconsin when I was in high school. Uh, and now I work with Team 1529 CyberCards, uh, Southport, Indiana. I've been involved first for about 13 years for FRC and another two for FLL. 
All right, I'm Logan Byers. Uh, this will be my 14th season. Um, I started with Team 461 as well, so I was with Nikhil um, for four years, uh, then went to the dark side and became a rep. Um, came back and uh, mentored for a couple years in college, uh, so I was a mentor for 1747. Um, since moving back to Indiana after taking a year in Wisconsin for work, um, I've become kind of a roaming mentor in Indiana. So I've helped a lot of teams uh, as far north as Logansport and here in Kokomo, and as far south as Bedford, Indiana. So um, any teams that are in Indiana that need help, I'm more than willing to help. Awesome. We also have Grace sitting in a corner, um, not on this, the stream. Oh. Come say hi, come say hi. You come in and say hi. Yeah. Yeah, oh, Jason, yeah. you too. Jason, yeah. Jason. Oh, yeah. Jason. Yeah. Come over too. Yeah. Come, come on yeah. in here. Okay. Hello. I'm Grace Johnson. I was on 2041 the Tears for three years, and then I'm currently mentoring him now. Cool. Uh, my name is Jason Hang. Uh, my original team is GRT192 in Palo Alto, California. And uh, I mentored 4272 uh, in Lafayette for two years. Hello, I'm Mark Fours. I've been uh, working as a mentor since 1997, so that makes about 19 years I've been involved with that. Started with 45, and I'm still with 45. Cool, Betsy. I'm Betsy Baxter. Uh, I was I'm an alumni of Team 1741. And then I graduated from college, and I've been mentoring Team 1747 up in Lafayette for four, three or four years. This is my 11th season first. Cool. Awesome. And then uh, we also have Brad. wonderful, uh, we are very much supported by our Andy Mark um, you know, crew here. Yep. The so crew? The crew? The Andy Mark crew. No, they don't want to come over. Jerry, 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 Brad. Jerry, Brad, Liz, and Liz. <laughs> we have our wonderful Indiana FTAs team John. mentors. And I lost John. So. Yeah. John was coughing up a lot. John was, oh, yeah. goodness. Did okay. you say your credentials? So. What am I supposed to say? Jerry Bud, mentor since 2000, 461. Yep, yep. That's where I've known some of these people from for quite a while. Um, FTAs for quite a while. Andy Mark, quite a while. <laughs> Usually say hey, I don't have to. How would they know that? I don't know. I'll, I'll appear with it tomorrow. How's that? There yeah, you go. I'm Brett Heininger. I was on 15, 29 in high school, uh, 2007, 2010. Uh, still help out with them a little bit now, but mainly just focused on Andy Mark and field supervising. I've done that for a few years. Right. That's it. You do too. And shout out to my Arizona, Arizona. 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 Arkansas. 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 Arkansas teams, Arkansas. Australia teams, Israel teams, and, and Michigan captains. Oh, well. Liz, Liz, Liz. Liz um, day one, I've already lost my voice, <laughs> which is ridiculous. i um, been a student on uh, Team 555 from New Jersey, um, and now I'm entering Cybertooth here out of Edinburgh, and also FTA, a lot of different places. Do you know how many years since you started? Since I started, I started in 2004, so I don't know. Well, you didn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot. All right.